Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Um, welcome to the, uh, uh, the, the second webinar uh, from uh, everybody here at Notio. Uh, my name is Ed Beechner Collins, and I head up the uh, sales and marketing here at Notio. And today I'm joined by uh, two colleagues, uh, Finn Robertson, who some of you uh, recognize some of the names on the attendee list. You may have uh, uh, actually communicated with, uh, with Finn, um, who heads up customer support in Europe, and Martin Chalafu, uh, who looks after customers uh, in North America and uh, Canada. Um, so uh, today, what we're going to, uh, uh, to do is just uh, for people who are new to Notio, I'm just going to do a very brief overview um, and explain how we develop the product, our history, where it comes from. Um, there's also uh, just a reminder for people who may or may not be aware, but we actually have a, uh, uh, the previous webinar which explains some uh, uh, useful things about how Notio works. Um, and then we'll move on to the, the main topic, which is uh, how to test with Notio. And that covers outdoor testing as well as um, testing indoors on a velodrome uh, and so on. Um, there is the opportunity to ask questions. So please uh, ask us questions. There's uh, an opportunity for us to answer those at the end, um, which again is, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's a little difficult to cover everything when you're presenting on topics like this. So uh, please use the Q&A and we'll do our best to uh, get those answered during uh, this webinar. So just, uh, it, you know, the, the whole concept of Notio started. Uh, Notio is a company that's uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of Argon 18, who's a, a, a bicycle manufacturer. Um, and obviously, if you've been watching some of the, the world uh, track cycling championships, um, you know, our bikes sort of figured in a lot of the, uh, the medals and maybe one or two records that were, uh, that were won. So I guess from that perspective, uh, there's always a, a, a heritage within the organization to learn about how we make things better and how we improve and try and find uh, you know, more speed. And that's obviously not just related to, uh, uh, to bikes. Um, and in 2016, there was a decision in the company to try and uh, figure out how we could put sensors uh, you know, inside a bike. And you'll, you know, looking at the, the picture on the left there, it's you know, a pedo tube sticking out the front of the bike, building electronics into it. And that obviously was, uh, you know, it's a notoriously difficult thing to do because obviously manufacturing bicycles, it's quite difficult to put electronics inside. So we decided to try and say, okay, can we take that electronics and, 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 and make it available outside the bike? And the original aim of the device was to try and uh, uh, obviously measure your coefficient drag or, uh, you know, how, how do you actually, you know, hone your position and stuff like that. So we produced the device that was, uh, uh, allowing you to uh, bolt that onto uh, uh, your bike and go and test, but also the vision was to connect it with other sensors. Um, then we, we said, okay, that's, that's actually quite uh, an ambitious plan. And uh, last year, we, or two years ago, we started to work with a lot of uh, uh, federations and teams to develop that concept and actually really hone the product. And then obviously uh, for a uh, full public launch uh, in 2019, uh, September of 2019, we, uh, we launched the product. But I guess the reason for explaining the history is um, the subject of trying to put a device on the bike to measure coefficient drag outside is extremely challenging. And we've been doing it for quite a number of years. We have learned a lot of different things about how you do that and you know, how not to do it, I guess. And then also by working with some of the, the, the world's best athletes, and again, pointing back to the, uh, the, the, the Danish, um, you know, team winning the, uh, the world championships, the uh, track this uh, past couple of weeks and breaking a record. While Notio wasn't uh, the main factor, but they did use that in their, uh, in their preparation to try and help. And I guess, we learn from that and we try and uh, take some of that and put it back into our product and help develop and all that kind of good stuff. 
So um, just just to recap, we uh, so one of our uh, big users, uh, um, Dan Bingham, who is obviously uh, working with that Danish team, we had a chance to chat with Dan. Um, and again, this link and this presentation will be available afterwards. So you'll be able to go back and watch it. If you haven't, you're, you're, a, you're, you're able to go and do that at any time. It's on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go and listen. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that, that's obviously quite a useful uh, thing to do. Um, right, so to uh, get into uh, the, the, the agenda and what we're here to talk about today and how to test with NoShio, um, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Finn to start, uh, who works in our support. And again, anybody who's needing support uh, with the product or if you're thinking of uh, investing in, uh, in NoShio and you want to buy one, um, you know, we have a team and we're obviously really, really uh, uh, keen to help and answer any questions, whether you're thinking or whether you've already got the product. So anyway, over to you, Finn. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ed. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Finn Robertson. I cover customer support for Europe. Um, so we're going to start off with today's subject of how to test with NoShio, and we'll focus on the two different ways to test, both indoor and outdoor. Um, so we'll start off testing about talking about testing outdoors, and then we'll cover testing indoor later. Um, originally, NoShio was developed as an outdoor testing tool. Um, even though we know it works inside uh, in a controlled environment, and it can bring you good results in a controlled environment inside. Um, yeah, primarily it was made as an outdoor tool. So this first part of the webinar, we're going to cover subjects such as the protocol, calibration, benchmark ride, and uh, the failure of your benchmark ride and potential error messages you may see if your benchmark ride has failed. Um, so I'll let my colleague Martin start with the protocol topic. Martin, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Martin, the customer uh, support for uh, NoShio in North America. Um, all right, thank you, Finn. Uh, let's start by uh, saying that uh, IO testing takes time and that to get results, you will need to apply a little bit of scientific rigor. That's where our uh, testing protocol uh, will come in handy. Understanding that a protocol is uh, simply a recipe for performing your home testing and training activities is key. Following a protocol will ensure you that uh, you have both a clear idea of how and where you will do the experiment and all, have all the materials needed. The NOSIO app offers a tool just for this. It's called the Benchmark Ride and will allow you to structure your first IRO test and calibration procedures. I will get into that uh, on the next slide, but first let's, let me talk a little bit uh, about safety. Because um, when testing, um, we encourage you to find a quiet path as free as possible from traffic. Um, and also you might be a high level cyclist, but uh, it is uh, important to keep in mind safety basics rules while you're on the road and especially when you're testing. Um, so be aware of everything on the road and signal your uh, intentions uh, appropriately. Um, so let's talk about uh, calibration. Uh, calibration is probably the most important thing to consider when starting out using your NoSio, and this is in order to get good and uh, real reliable results. Um, why so, Mar uh, Martin, I just uh, uh, break in there. I guess for some people, uh, you know, the, 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 the question about calibration, and, and, and I guess I just try to, I mean, I'm a coach myself, so uh, I understand how some of these things are really important. And I would just make the point for everybody listening on the webinar that, um, you know, we, while it's not a direct comparison, but I think if you go back many years ago when power meters first came out, um, there was a lot of 
are, you know, not arguments, but a lot of discussion about how best to, to do, you know, use that kind of product uh, outside and, you know, what kind of tests you did. You know, there was a lot of discussion around testing inside versus outside, which is still there today, interestingly. Um, people realizing when they go on Zwift and stuff like that, there's a slight difference to outside and things like that. Um, and even though the, 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 I, some of you um, I know will have been involved with power meters way back, um, knowing some of the names that are on the attendee list. But, um, you know, I can remember using the power meter first and before every time I went out, I had to press calibrate. And of course, it's like, okay, have I calibrated the power meter? But even now today, for some, some of the products out there, they've, you know, you don't have to calibrate as much and, 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 and stuff like that. So, so in, our, in our world, in Notia world, the calibration is, is obviously, it's not the same, but it's something, uh, something similar. Um, and it's really important to set that baseline so that you're collecting uh, uh, accurate data. And no different to how you apply things like, if I'm, if I'm uh, testing and I'm trying to work out where my fitness is and no different to our recommendations, you know, we all, we're all probably aware of our five minute roads, our one minute roads, our 20 minute climbs and stuff like that. And we see that uh, people who use the product tend to, and when we test ourselves, we have these sort of locations that we tend to go back to and use um, when, we're, uh, uh, when we're testing. So sorry, Martin, but uh, back to you. I just thought I'd uh, make that point as a, more as a coach than uh, somebody trying to uh, talk about no shield. Thank you very much, uh, Head, for uh, this uh, clarification. Um, so to, uh, to go with the first uh, topic, uh, why calibrate? Uh, the uh, calibration is used uh, to make sure that the wind speed is correctly measured by the no shield speed tube. It's important to understand that the rider, his bike, and equipment creates uh, turbulence around the pitot tube as the pictures shown uh, on, the, on the screen. Because of this, the airspeed measured by the no position is slightly different than the rider's true airspeed. Calibration is then necessary to correct that value and generate a personal calibration factor that solves this issue. Um, what, what is a, a calibration factor? Uh, it's a number used in the calculation of uh, CDA and the wind speed it is uh, related to the way that the wind impacts the cyclists and the position of the nocio on the bike. So how do we calibrate this? Uh, so now uh, our app uh, has the screenshot on the right. So uh, go on ahead, thanks. Uh, so as you can see on the, on the screenshots, um, our app offer automatic method in order to guide through the process called the benchmark ride. Um, it will allow you to determine your calibration factor and set your initial CDA you can use to compare your rights. Uh, please note that calibration can also be performed and analyzed afterwards in uh, Golden Sheet on Osio. So just another point on that, uh, uh, Martin, and, and I think it's an important thing to point out, and uh, I kind of skipped over it earlier in the, uh, the history, but uh, where we're based, the, the, the Notio company is based in Montreal, uh, we're very lucky to be uh, part of, uh, there's a, a large uh, research community for artificial intelligence in, uh, uh, in Montreal. So a lot of the large technology companies are using this, uh, this center to help develop. And as we know, with the, the internet and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of things around predicting and, and, and all that kind of good stuff. So what's that got to do with this benchmark right and how we uh, how we do stuff and you know there's there's uh, uh, as we said earlier it's a challenge to try and take the notio a device put it on your bike and go outside we know there's challenges and there'll be lots of people who are uh, aerodynamics uh, uh, experts will definitely you know rightly so argue that you know there's a lot of uh, potential for uh, uh, for error but what we're doing and our strategy longer term is investing in how some of this artificial intelligence and some of this technology can be used to, uh, uh, to reduce and perhaps uh, uh, make the uh, ability of the notio to become uh, even more uh, accurate than it is, uh, it is currently. And that's a path that we've started and uh, perhaps not for this webinar, but certainly in the future, we'll be able to talk more about that. And part of the reason why we've introduced the benchmark, right, is it's probably a step towards that in terms of giving 
uh, users the ability to go out, make a test once you've chosen the right place and you're riding safely, um, and then to provide that intelligence uh, while you're out there. You don't want to have to come back, sit at a computer, and as I said, using the power meter example of many, many moons ago, you, 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 you had to come back and download the data and look and everything. And of course, now you can just see it straight away on your head unit. You can do some brief analysis uh, you know, with your phone. And, and obviously, we have the advantage of developing a product now where uh, we can do that. Um, but I just thought I'd make that point as we're you know, talking about outside testing and removing you know, any sort of areas of error. Uh, we are working very hard and there is a program. And as I said, being located in Montreal, we have got presence with this uh, uh, Mila, which is a, a, a research center and we actually have a desk there and, and so on. But uh, again, we'll probably talk about that in a future webinar to explain. So again, sorry, Martin, but I just thought an important point uh, for people to be aware of. Yes, of course, totally. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, so before my uh, colleague Finn um, go uh, further on with uh, the benchmark, right? I, I was just uh, saying that uh, um, you you need to do a benchmark right to calibrate the device for your own uh, personal setup. Um, it's important to remember to recalibrate if uh, the nocio changes position. For example, if you uh, change uh, your stack high or change your TT extension position. In some very specific cases, where you would want to test the difference between a TT position and an upright position, uh, for example, base bar, you would also need to recalibrate because the wind flow around the nocio will have changed. So um, Finn can uh, can go on with uh, with the benchmark right now. Okay, so we just got to look at a few things to consider when performing a benchmark ride. Um, we've got the the course, the conditions, and then we'll move on to the potential error messages and repeatability after that. So a few key, um, a few key points when looking at the course. We've got out and back. In the app, you'll see it recommends three kilometers out and three kilometers back. But this can be reduced if you don't have a stretch of road that's long enough. Um, I'd recommend it's better doing a shorter distance on a good stretch of road than the full 3k on a on a worse road where the results may be maybe a bit iffy um but we at least rec recommend doing 1.5k out and 1.5k back i'd say this is the bare minimum to get good data from from your test run um and you should keep in mind like wherever or however you're riding, you should ride in a position which you're able to sustain for both the out and the back. Um, riding in this constant position is really important. Um, as we mentioned, the same start and finish, we recommend well, you've got to have the same start and finish for it to be a successful benchmark ride. Uh, for the no-show algorithms to calculate your benchmark CDA, uh, yeah, the ride must finish and start in the same place. And then we mentioned not too many corners. This is mainly because it can alter your position when you corner. Even though if it's a corner you can pedal around and you can stay tucked up on the extensions or on your drops. Um, the, it's natural to want to lift your head to look around the corner and it can alter your position a little bit. Um, so yeah, we recommend not too many corners and it's the same with elevation and descending um we recommend it's fairly flat so you're not trying to like lift yourself up to get air in when you're climbing and then we'll move on to conditions where we've got uh, just be uh, just before that finn uh, the yeah. other thing as well is uh, i guess uh, uh, accelerations and deaccelerations also because if you have yeah. if, if you introduce some corners you're going to have to press the pedals a little bit harder. So, um, yeah, sure. I mean, these are, you know, obviously again, we'll make recommendations and we know we've got, you know, we've got users now, uh, um, pretty much all continents on the world. I mean, in the current climate, yes, there's uh, some people, unfortunately, uh, uh, cannot get out. Um, but, uh, you know, 
we know that in the UK, the road system is slightly different to what we have in Canada, to what we have in uh, uh, the, um, the United States, to Australia. Um, and also it's, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the weather uh, varies greatly. Um, however, the advantage, of course, is that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're learning about this information and uh, obviously adapting the product to, uh, uh, to allow us to do that. And again, uh, you know, already we're working on improvements around the, 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 the app itself where some of these things are uh, taken into consideration. So as with any piece of software, an app, um, it's never uh, uh, stationary. It's always an, an evolving piece. So... Um, I don't know, over perfect the, the the right conditions, Finn. I yeah. guess is the so. I say the perfect conditions, but it's hard to get the perfect conditions. So I mentioned low wind, and obviously a bit of wind's fine. But if it's gusty and inconsistent, and maybe from like a lateral wind, crosswind, it might affect the results a bit. So try and pick pick a route which uh, you can avoid this, or pick a time where you can avoid this. Um, dry uh, even though no shows water resistant uh, we advise you don't test in the rain or if it's standing water on the road because um, if the water can bring up pit, bits of dirt or grit on the road uh, and these can end up blocking the pitot tube if, if you test in these conditions and then traffic free ideally traffic free we know this isn't possible for most people but uh, if you try and choose a road with minimum traffic and as little large traffic as possible so like trucks and lorries because these can really affect the wind speed either make it spike or make it low depending on which way the traffic's going so on to the next slide we've got the potential error messages you may see um so to start off with we've got oh these error messages come up when when the test results rejected it happens because if there's too large a disparity um between the out and the inward trip um it's an indication that like two, one or two of the test conditions haven't been consistent during the ride so it might be caused by a difference in altitude um, this will be it can often be caused if it's not started or stopped in the right position um, and you're on a hillier course um, we've got the difference in wind speed may affect it um, this is often if there's turbulence from traffic or wind gusts or crosswinds as i mentioned before um, and uh, just just on that uh, uh finn again I mean, because we've been working on this project uh for a number of years and obviously uh extensive testing and stuff like that um you know we believe that the software obviously an area that we put a lot of effort into and obviously uh, we've made the, uh, uh, the, the 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 mention of algorithms and stuff like that um, so we do use this information to try and improve and uh, as I said again back to this uh, uh, this whole uh, the, the, the point of the product being able to test outside and deal with these uh, these errors but what we're finding is the more uh, uh, the more advances we make um, then it becomes better and obviously the potential error messages you know it's it's again it's another way of knowing that when you're outside doing something um, when you're using the product you haven't gone all the way home and downloaded data to find that you've, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not working. Because if you've got a 1.5 kilometer to three kilometer out and back that you're doing your test on, you know, if something doesn't go quite right, you've got the chance to go and collect, uh, uh, to collect more data. And again, just, just for everybody's benefit, what we're saying is that this is in the context of you uh, looking to find a baseline and a benchmark CDA for you as a rider. Okay. So, you know, it's not something, and as we said earlier, you don't have to go and do this uh, baseline benchmark, right? Every single time you go out. And that's an important point. So once the system has a baseline and uh, back to my point earlier about, you know, your, 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 your baseline power, your FTP power, it's, 
you know, you want to know what that baseline is. So if you do want to go and test helmets and you want to go and test something else, you know what you're comparing it against. So, so that's quite important. But the error messaging, we don't want you to, you know, people to look here, especially people who may have already got the product or may be thinking of it. Um, it's there for a reason because we want to make sure that you get good data, um, you know, from using the device. Yeah. So when we're talking about wind speed, um, I'd say to put a number on it, if it's stable, ideally it could be around eight or 10 kilometers an hour. That would be a, a good place to have the wind. Eight to 10 kilometers an hour or below, it'd be, I'd say that would avoid having an error message. And, and, and it, it, those of you living in the Northern Hemisphere over the last couple of weeks, uh, months, that's probably been a bit difficult to find. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's uh, um, hopefully uh, the weather gets a bit more stable and in these terrible, unfortunate circumstances, uh, depending on where you are, um, hopefully you'll have a little bit of time uh, to uh, get out on your bikes and uh, uh, do some testing and so on. And obviously we hope that this, uh, this information will help also. Mm -hmm. So next we've got the difference in distance on the out and back points. And as I mentioned before, again, it needs to start and finish in the same place. Uh, so yeah, that's what that error message would be from. Um, next, a difference in CDA out and CDA back. This doesn't have to be, your CDA doesn't have to be exactly the same on the out and back, but it has to be within a certain, um, within a certain limit. So this will be caused if your body changes too much or if you're accelerating and decelerating too much. So if a car pulls out and you've got a break, um, this may be why, why a test has failed. And then uh, impossible to find intervals for out and back. Um, this will be when it can't recognize whether you've turned around or not. So this may be caused if you've not gone far enough out. So if you've gone less than a kilometer and a half, um, it won't recognize you turning around. Um, and then speed and power connection, which will be caused by speed sensor and power meter dropouts. So check check your speed sensors are charged or have batteries in and make sure they're paired before you start. Uh, on the, uh, the power meter issue, again, it's, it's a variable for sure. Uh, um, and we do have more advanced analysis in uh, uh, Golden Cheetah. So we can actually, on deeper analysis, pick up on uh, drivetrain efficiency and stuff like that. Uh, and again, the, 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 you know, this will be uh, uh, some you know, older power meters, some brands we won't even need to mention. Um, but I think now, as, 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 as uh, we're certainly seeing on the, on the power meters, on the newer models that we're uh, testing against, and again, on our FAQ, on our website, we mention uh, you know, some of the different ones that we have. Um, so we know that there's uh, definitely, uh, you know, if we go and compare to a very old one, to some of the new ones, there's, a, there's obviously a huge difference. And I'm sure some of you who have you know, used uh, power meters will have seen that as well, um, where the potential uh, sort of uh, quality of data has certainly improved, so. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you get a message at the end saying the calibration ride's been successful. So next we've got moving on to repeatability. Um, we've recently done a blog article with Martin Toff um, speaking about how he makes his data repeatable and precise. So we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so yeah, previously we mentioned uh, the protocol methods and it's important to consider the procedure used for when you're testing as well. Um, this will include when you're testing and also how you test. So first we've got same day, um, and we'd recommend if you're testing two components against each other to get the most accurate data, I'd recommend doing it on the same day. Um, 
just because the conditions are the it'll be most similar or most likely to be the most similar similar um also you'd have to take a note of everything you're wearing because it's no good testing a set of wheels if you're wearing one day wearing a set of aero socks and one day wearing normal socks so another thing to look out for is uh yeah either testing on the same day or making a note of everything you're using um we'll move on to precision again making sure everything's the same um but this uh, we can add to this concentrating on keeping in a solid position that not only you can maintain from one test run but you can uh, maintain from a whole day of testing um so this can be down to your finger position even so try and concentrate on and remember which how you're holding your bars etc um because it'll all make a difference to when you're testing um also make sure if you uh change your cockpit or change your position on your bike you've we recommend you do a calibration run again is this can alter your calibration factor so you'd need to uh, get a new calibration factor before you test. So now we'll move on to repeatability. And this is where uh, Martin Toff did a blog and um, told us how he tests with the no-show. Um, there are two ways to do it. You can either do, as you can see, A, B, A, B. So A being one setup and B being another setup. Or A, 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 B, 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 and then back to A. Uh, for most cyclists, doing A, B, A, B is a bit difficult because you're constantly making changes to your bike. And if you don't have a day of testing, you know how tiring it can be and it can just, it can make the day even longer. So by doing the second method, A, 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 B, 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 and then back to A, it means you can just get test runs done, then make the changes after. Um, but then make sure you go back to A just to get make sure the accuracy is there in your testing. Um, obviously, but this just, topic... Just on that point, uh, uh, Finn, again, I was just putting my coach hat back on here for a second yeah. because, you know, um, and, and I guess because, uh, you know, some people uh, may have been very fortunate enough to go to a wind tunnel and do some testing, and some of these protocols uh, are adopted in that scenario also. Um, but if you think of the time it takes to go and the money you spend to go and do that, obviously with the no-show, you can do this anytime you want. But I also would make the point that, you know, in some cases, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll use certain, you know, we've seen people make huge advantages, uh, you know, in terms of testing outside. And you know, we're working with some, uh, unfortunately, they're not racing right now, but some world tour uh, uh, level uh, riders who, you know, go in the wind tunnel, then go outside and go, hang on, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap between what I've got on the wind tunnel numbers or the track testing, and I'm not able to re re recreate those outside. And I guess one of the dilemmas they face is actually how much time they can actually do uh, and spend the testing. And my question back to them is to say, actually, hang on, if you're in a GC position and you need to make sure that you don't lose 13 seconds or 20 seconds in, a, uh, in that scenario, how much is that worth to you? And then the ABAB versus AABB testing and the time it takes becomes very, very valuable. So I think, you know, what we're trying to say is that, um, yes, we want to make it easier. We want to make it more convenient while you're out there testing. But at the same time, as you develop your use of the tool, and it is, it's a long-term relationship you have with the tool. You know, again, you know, not to labor the point, but you didn't stick a power meter on on day one and figure everything out. It took time. You got to learn how to use it. You got to learn how to get the most out of it. And I think it's fair to say people are still learning and getting more out of uh, power meters and how to train and how to, to sort of correlate to RPE and all that kind of good stuff. And I think for aero testing outside, it's exactly the same. And it's, uh, you know, we always say to, you know, even 
you know, if you've got uh, somebody uh, who's looking to improve on uh, uh, triathlon or uh, uh, time trial or whatever it might be, then it becomes really, really powerful to say, actually, I can invest this time um, and, and, and ask yourself the question, if you've reached the plateau or uh, physiological plateau in terms of your training, you know, maybe some of your sessions become really important to go and do this kind of testing. Yes, it takes time, but the gain you make is potentially, uh, you know, uh, quite significant. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm nearly at the end of this section. Um, obviously, all of this that we're mentioning can be uh, used when you're testing indoors as well on the velodrome. Um, and if you haven't already, I'd recommend going over to the blog on our website and having a look at the some of the articles I mentioned. Um, yeah. And, and, and on the blog as well, just, just so you're aware, I mean, we've got a newsletter and we're trying to, you know, publish and share a lot of information and use of the, uh, of the product. So make sure you subscribe and, 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 and if, you, if you don't know where those are, just get in touch um, and we're happy to, to, to do that. But we're trying to, you know, use the, uh, the experience we've gained and, and, and we've got a program to to obviously share a lot more of, uh, of that information, which will hopefully allow your use of the product and uh, uh, help get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, so, so now it's over to Martin, who's gonna um, explain the indoor testing. All right, uh, thank you, Finn. So um, now that we've uh, covered the outdoor testing, um, let's talk about uh, indoor velodrome testing. So as some of you might be know, uh, the benchmark right tool is uh, based on uh, performing an out and back. And that is not possible or really practical in the uh, velodrome. However, uh, we know that a lot of you train uh, inside during uh, winter or simply because uh, track is your discipline. We currently don't have a velodrome specific benchmark test and app. However, we do have a velodrome specific testing protocol to record and analyze your data. So this will require to use uh, of our uh, Golden Cheetah Nocio edition, which is uh, available for download on our website. You can find it uh, on uh, our uh, page uh, nocio.ai. It will be, uh, the link will be in the, on, in the footer. Um, so the document um, we also have uh, on your left, on, on, on your right, sorry, at the quick start uh, user guide, uh, Golden Cheetah Nocio. Um, this document will be uh, released in the next days uh, about uh, getting started with uh, Golden Cheetah Nocio. And in this document, we teach you how to find your calibration uh, factor uh, while you're um, uh, benchmark uh, test right in the velodrome. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I will explain uh, how uh, this all works. So um, testing in a bit of room is quite light, uh, what we previously covered. The testing protocol guidelines uh, are much the same. The protocol that we suggest to do, uh, which is going pretty fine for most of our uh, indoor tester, uh, you need to perform two, 3,000 meters lap at a steady space. Um, making sure to hold the same position during the whole test. Um, recording can be done um, with normal writing mode accessed uh, in the app. You can then uh, upload your files um, to the app and access them via your uh, online account in Golden Cheetah Nocio Edition. Um, in Golden Cheetah, you will be able to calculate your calibration factor and get you indoor velodrome aero test result uh, CDA. The specifics uh, on how to perform this are covered in a spe specific uh, guide, um, uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, um, that uh, will publish uh, by the end uh, of uh, the week, uh, of this week. So keep in mind that uh, for indoor testing altitude, can be set to zero in the Golden Cheetah. Um, and specific for uh, this are also to be covered in the guide. 
Uh, just one other point on this as well is, uh, uh, again, um, you know, I've worked with lots of people where they've done the, uh, the velodrome testing. Uh, if you take the data into Golden Cheetah, there is the opportunity for you to get the raw data uh, uh, out in a CSV file format. So if you do want to use uh, another tool to, to do some analysis, which some people do, and uh, that's obviously, you know, uh, another technical level again, but we are aware that some people will collect the data and go and analyze, but that's also another uh, useful uh, feature. So it allows you to take that and uh, maybe you want to compare, um, you know, so we have some people who are using it to, uh, uh, to look at formation and team pursuit and stuff like that. So um, the analysis isn't necessarily done inside uh, uh, here, but it can be uh, uh, used elsewhere. So that's obviously another level again, but it is available for you to do if you want to do that. All right, so uh, this is uh, pretty much it for uh, indoor uh, velodrome testing. So um, you can go on ahead. Sure, so I think we've, uh, we may have been answering some of these questions as we've uh, gone along, but let's, uh, let's just double check. We've, uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, unless there's, um, okay, so we've got, uh, let's see. if we have a fixed position for the no-show, let's say fixed to the base bar, do we need to run a benchmark when testing different stack heights in the TT position? Uh, base bar stays the same. That's a good question. Right, okay, so let's uh, take that. Um, okay. Yeah, so one of the things I would say about that is that if you're, uh, if you're testing outside, the base bar position for the NOCO isn't in an ideal position as it will be impacted by the wind coming from one side or the other. So one of the things we recommend is that the NOCO should be mounted um, as far forward as you possibly can. And Actually, we've just, uh, we've just recently done some videos to help around this as well. So it'll be quite, uh, uh, um, it can be quite, uh, quite useful. So, um, and obviously the, 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 the other important thing is to make sure it's, uh, uh, it's centered. So, um, so that'll, that, 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 that should, uh, so the recommendation there is you try and position it as far forward uh, using the mount on the uh, TT bars as opposed to the, uh, the base bar. Um, so next one, uh, wind direction influences the performance of the test. Uh, what wind speed affects the test? Uh, do, 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 that's a good question. Um, so let's see. Uh, Just come back to that in a second. Um, yeah, so on the wind speed, um, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. I mean, our recommendation uh, is that you have. Um, uh, you know, something around eight to 10 kilometers is ideal um, or below, obviously. Um, and then obviously if it's, you know, anything that's, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, traffic can cause uh, 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 fluctuations and stuff like that. But when you're doing a benchmark test, you would get that as a sort of a, a critical thing anyway. So I would go back and say, okay, the important thing is to make sure you've got stable conditions when you're doing a benchmark test um, and so on. Um, so I'm just going to ask uh, uh, another colleague to uh, to join because uh, we've got some other uh, no-show colleagues here will be able to answer some more of these questions as I go through them. So rather than uh, me trying to read and answer at the same time. Um, so let's, uh, yeah. Hi, Guillaume. Hi, guys. <laughs> I've been following from a... From a distance, we're all so, working. Uh, uh, Guillaume Lamy is our uh, uh, product manager. So, uh, um, 
we'll uh, we'll let Guillaume answer some of these more technical questions. So over to you, Guillaume. Thank you. So uh, I'll get to the questions. So uh, I'll just go through them uh, one after the other. Um, mostly all of those questions are actually going to be answered pretty soon in a, in a video series that we're pushing out. We're actually approving them this week, uh, just in time for the, <laughs> for the COVID season where everybody needs to stay in-house. So we'll have some content ready. So we'll be covering uh, you know, the basic setup, how to put it on your bike, different recommendations, going over benchmark again, all the things we covered today. So um, I'll start again, maybe with some questions that were already asked, but you know, if we have a fixed position for the no-sio, let's say fixed to the base bar, do we need to run a new benchmark when testing different stack heights in the TT position? You know, base bar stays the same. The, the main thing, the main recommendation you, we have usually for a normal setup is that the no-sio is a fixed, as Ed mentioned, as, as far forward as possible. So that means that usually you would fix it on your, um, on your, uh, your TT extensions meaning that it's kind of easy. You see if the no-show moves around. Uh, if you change your stack, uh, well, basically it moves, so you recalibrate. Uh, then it gets a bit more complicated if you actually affix it to your, um, uh, to your base bars. The main recommendation for base bars, as we said, that it needs to be centered. So um, if you do put it on the right or left side of your, of your base bars, the problem is, is that then um, the device uh, could get a, a, a wrongful uh, um, uh, reading uh, from the wind. If ever you have some yaw uh, and it comes from the opposite side where the, um, uh, the device is positioned, well, uh, then we won't capture you know, um, uh, the full spectrum of, of, of what the no show usually um, is able to capture. So again, really the recommendation is to put uh, centered. So if you use like a, like a let's say, a kind of the, the lollipop, uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, it's, it, actually I'm, I'm losing my English, but it's the, it's the, the form of a lollipop where you can attach your, uh, your mount, uh, the no-show. So that usually uh, makes sure that it's uh, fixed and centered. What happens there, uh, you have to keep in mind that even though that the no-show doesn't move, like you saw in the webinar, there's an image where we see the, 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 the frontal uh, impact of uh, being in a TT position towards airflow coming you know, between your, your TT position and the wheel. So um, you have to take that into account. So basically, if you consider that the frontal position affects the airflow going towards the no-show, you should recalibrate. So let's say you try uh, a, an example. Let's say uh, you are affixed to the base bar and you just change uh, slightly uh, the width um, of your, um, of your, uh, your extensions. Uh, that shouldn't affect too much the, the, you know, the, the, the frontal area of where, of where the wind affects the no-show. But if you do change your stack or change uh, the, the angle of your, of, of your bars, well then uh, for sure it's gonna change the, your position relative to the no-show, so that's gonna affect airflow, so you should recalibrate then. So the idea is, let's say you do uh, uh, try two different positions, it's almost like if the no-show moved. So uh, it affects airflow, it, you should recalibrate in those circumstances. circumstances. So the thing is to remember is once you've done your test and you found your, 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 your CDA and you calibrated, you calibrated for that position. So when you go ride um, uh, again and train and do longer rides out of the benchmark uh, mode, well then uh, um, you know, make sure that uh, your device is calibrated for that position and not for another one that you tested before. I uh, hope this answers uh, the questions. If not, just write in the comments and you know, I can give you further details. So basically, yes, you know, you have to take into account all the, these factors and how the wind influences the, you know, the no-show and the airflow. Uh, so, uh, Guillaume, just another question in there. Uh, um, do I need to carry my AOS device on the bike during my benchmark ride and our test ride? Um, I... So, so on, on that, there's multiple different scenarios in which you could, you know, um, uh, start the, uh, start the no-show. Uh, you know, there's the head unit, there's the no-show itself, and there's the app. So for sure, the app is always necessary to actually do the, the initial setup, because uh, basically it's the app that allows uh, for the, you know, to, to access the communication of the no-show, and then the no-show can pair with all the different settings. So the, the app is always necessary for, for, for pairing and initial setup. After that, there's different ways of, 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 of using the device. Is if, you've, um, if you actually paired it with your Garmin, uh, you can use the Garmin when you start the ride. If it's paired and you, you've got the IQ fields installed, well then um, by starting the, uh, your Garmin and your ride, you should uh, see the no-show start, um, start blinking on the, on the side, the, the green light. The green light sometimes in the, 
in uh, you know uh, sunny conditions it's hard to see so um, make sure you really <laughs> look close at it but uh, if it's it's blinking it's recording the only thing is is that that at that point uh, it'll, it'll it'll be harder for you to know if it's you know it's if it's uh, capturing your uh, your um, your power meter and your speed sensor so um, you know after you've used it a couple of times and you're comfortable with it I would say that at that point you can start you know using the head unit but on the first few a few attempts you just make sure that you have your 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 app with you and your phone uh, just to make sure that you know everything is working fine but once you get comfortable for sure you can use the head unit and there's a more advanced way of using it actually you can you can use it without the head unit um, on the side of the device the power button once it's it, it's um, it's powered on and it's been on for about uh, 10 seconds there's like a boot sequence um, after about 10 seconds of being powered on you can tap two times really fast on the power button and it's actually going to start the recording and you press two times again and then that will stop the recording um, that's another way of using it but basically when you're doing that you, you should be really comfortable with with the device um, and knowing that uh, you always need a power meter and a speed sensor and when you're just using the no-show alone without the app or a head unit you have no way of actually knowing if it's if it's paired or not so um, so uh, just be uh, be careful when you uh, when you use these different scenarios and then the next question is could you tell me how to best preserve the battery when the device is not being used for a while over the winter good question well for sure the type of battery that we use if, if you if you leave it at about 80 uh, percent um, or, or full capacity uh, it should you know for sure it should tough the for, for, for a couple of months without uh, being activated. Best practice would be just to, you know, uh, uh, um, every three months just to plug it in, make sure that it's, uh, the, the battery is stable. But if you, um, if you uh, leave the battery 80% to 100%, um, uh, when, you, when comes the, the, you know, after, after three or four months, when you take it out, it should, it should still be stable. Just then uh, make sure that you, uh, you plug it in again and, um, and, uh, and put it back to 100%. And then uh, just uh, and if ever, if ever any anybody has a, a problems with the battery or anything with the product, you know we're really backing it up. That's why we're you know we're all here. So you know just contact support. We'll make sure that we 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 find a quick uh, resolution to any any hardware problems that you that you might encounter or questions that you might have. Uh, can we get comparable results from track to outdoor testing using uh, Golden Cheetah? Is the question I guess so. Um, so, so on that subject, the main thing to remember is like, so there's, there's a big debate, you know, uh, what's your CDA when you go to wind tunnel, can you compare them those numbers to, to track indoors, uh, to track outside to outdoor conditions? Well, the thing to remember is that, um, CDA is a relative value, uh, especially at the speeds at which, uh, we're, we're, we're taking the measures. Um, uh, you know, aer aerodynamics is a very complicated, uh, uh, field. But um, in, 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 in the speeds between, you know, 20 kilometers an hour and, and 80 kilometers an hour, um, uh, and turbulence can affect uh, uh, all the measurements. So what's important, to, <laughs> what I want to get at is that you might not have the exact same uh, CDA number. So you go in a wind tunnel or in a track and you see a, a, a 0.265. When you, um, when you go outside, uh, you might have a, a 0.255 or a 0.26. It's also relative to the speed at which you capture the, uh, your data. Um, that doesn't mean to say that the CDA is wrong or that one is better than the other. What's important to remember, it's the deltas that are important. So every time that we do tests, and we'll, we'll try to write articles about that also, but, but let's say we go in the wind tunnel and that's what we've, we've recently done. Uh, we tested the same positions that we did test uh, in a velodrome and that we did test outside. What we got as a result was, was um, uh, slight variations in the CDA but no variations on the deltas. So meaning that that's, that's what you test. So if you test two or three different positions in, 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 in a velodrome, you should get to a very uh, a low amount of margin of error, the same deltas when you go outside. So on that point, I won't give you the exact precision of it. We'll have some, some more data about it. Is it, is it one or 2% you know, uh, difference? It's, 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 it's it's there or below, but, um, but basically your deltas should be the same. So when you compare your results, you should compare your outdoor testing results, keeping that in mind that it's the, the deltas between the positions that, that, that should be the same. And then once you know that, you can try to kind, kind of derive what, what, what variations you have from, from outdoor to indoor. 
in the future, we'll try to have tools to kind of like help you with that a bit more, but uh, that's, that's basically it. I don't know if I got it. I got too complicated or not, Ed. Uh, was that? No, no, no. I think answer? that's, uh, yeah. And, and, and again, as we said, uh, you know, we've got two, two areas uh, that you can contact us, obviously uh, support, but we've also started to build out a, a knowledge base. Uh, I think some of you who've, who've submitted a ticket to get support, uh, it will sort of uh, guide you to that. But again, just reach out to us. Um, you know, it's uh, 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 really easy. And, and again, we're just trying to make a lot of this information available um, and, 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 and more widely. So one last question, uh, Guillaume. Um, uh, can the battery be replaced like an iPhone when it eventually degrades? Um, so I don't know if you, uh, obviously the answer is, uh, is no. But again, we're trying to, we're trying to make sure that uh, within reason, obviously not years and years and years, but uh, we're trying to be very supportive. So if there is a, an issue with a battery uh, uh, early on, then uh, we certainly will, uh, uh, you know, we'll look at replacing that uh, uh, for sure. So well, but there the isn't a solution. The answer from a product manager standpoint is that, yes, you can change the battery, but you can't do it by yourself. So yeah. basically at the point where you've used it, so much. <laughs> um, the battery should should last for a long while. I don't have the exact stats. I think we have them in the FAQ of our um, of our um, of our website about battery life. But um, uh, if ever you do find that the battery starts to be faulty or doesn't last as long as you, uh, you it was when you when we got it out of the box, just contact us and we can always you know uh, uh, we haven't set that up yet, but we'll do like a battery replacement program or something like that because we can we can open the device and just uh, uh, put a new battery in. It's just not something that we uh, would recommend you guys to do, and it's not a standard battery you can just take off off, off of the shelves. And if ever you're too far on the other end of the world, well may, maybe we'll try to support it in a different way. But um, uh, for sure, in uh, in two or three years of time, when you do feel that your battery is going down, you know we'll 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 try to have some kind of a battery replacement uh, system in place. But in the uh, meantime, contact uh, us directly. Can you compare two or more readings side by side? So uh, I'm I'm well, I can answer that actually. So in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, on the app currently, it's uh, it's obviously not easy to compare uh, two. Uh, in Gold and Chidi, you can. However, and I'm sure, uh, Gum, you might want to talk about what we've... And, and again, we'll give you a teaser here, I think, about what's coming because we do want to talk about that in the next webinar. Um, so I don't know if you want to add any more to that. So it's, I guess, two, uh, two runs side by side on the, uh, uh, on the app. Yeah, so you can, so I just, I just, I think the, my sound cut for a couple of seconds there, yep. but uh, if you can compare runs, for sure you can compare runs, but again, there's things that you have to keep in mind, um, uh, since again, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, this question is asking, can you do that side by side? So at the moment, uh, doing two side by side on the same screen is not possible, right? Oh no, so we don't have the, like a compare tool directly in there. You have to you know, take out your notebook and, <laughs> and take some notes on the side, but, uh, um, you can, you can do a compare side by side on uh, golden cheetah. So that's obviously, uh, you know, another step, but right now on the app, if you're at the side of the road, you cannot do a direct comparison. So is that you something where it and your, your activity details you would, yeah. So go from one activity to the other. Is that something you're planning, uh, down the line Guillaume, for the, so, so we're, we're actually working really hard on a, on a new version where all that we've learned from you guys in the past, uh, in the past month. Um, the compare tool hasn't been uh, baked in because we, we felt that uh, you can actually like uh, do it in Golden Cheetah if you wanted or basically get the different CDAs and some of the values out and, and, and shot, you know, uh, chart them down on a, on, a, on, a, on a piece of paper. So going the traditional way there, um, we're basically on the new release that will be coming, uh, you know, uh, now things are s sort of slowing down a little bit with all the, the, the COVID-19, uh, but uh, um, we were planning uh, for a mid-April release. It may be pushed a month down, just depending on resource availability and stuff like that. But um, what we're going to be offering is that benchmark tool that we've uh, been talking about. It's kind of hard to get at, and that, that we do get. You have to go in the settings. You have to have the no-show that's activated, and then, you know, to access that tool, it it's, it's harder. So we're, we're actually planning to, when you actually start writing, we ask you, what, what, what are you planning to do? So uh, an easier access to that and, and an easier way to actually analyze your data inside of the app, not to compare between rides, but to kind of drill down inside of a, an actual uh, ride result 
Um, these are the actual things that are, are, are coming forward um, uh, and the availability to create uh, multiple bike profiles you know, uh, with the app. These are the things that we're actively working on. Um, so the compare tool is something that we, uh, that we, that we do think of, but it's not planned in, in, the, in the near, near future. Yeah. And if you, uh, if you want to see how you can do that in Golden Cheetah, uh, we do have some, uh, we will have some webinar uh, content coming around Golden Cheetah, obviously, because some people do want to analyze and do more sort of uh, in-depth stuff. If you don't want to wait for that, just get in touch and we can show you how to do that because it's very easy in Golden Cheetah to do side-by-side -side comparison between two, two, three, four, or five different activities. So I think that's, uh, uh, hopefully we've answered all the questions, but again, uh, as I said, uh, you know, don't hesitate to, uh, to get in touch and, um, you know, uh, support obviously, or through the knowledge base. This webinar has been recorded, so you will be able to re-listen and go back to certain points of it. For sure, you'll get an email uh, uh, there. So unless uh, any of my colleagues have anything else to say, um, you know, just want to take the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in the product. Thank you very much for taking the time and, and listening to what we've been talking about. Um, it's a lot of information, um, but uh, thank you. So Guillaume, uh, Martin, Finn, anything else you want to add before we close this off? I'm good. Thanks, Ed. Thanks yeah, to everyone. Me. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for listening and uh, stay safe out there and hope you do manage to get out and get some uh, uh, some rides in during these uh, these difficult times. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks.